few monkeys on the edge, but we already are second in our theme of a world of migrants. Um, I want to thank uh, first the Sheldon for opening the space for us. It's not an easy moment around the world, uh, especially for presidential events, and we're so lucky that the Sheldon has supported us so we can be in this um, um, open space um, um, during these pandemic days. Um, I'm also quite excited about the exhibitions in the Sheldon right now, um, um, and we're going to check some of them out and invite you to do. Um, I already looked at the Nature of Waste exhibition, it's absolutely stunning. Um, um, so I invite you to do that. Um, Humanities on the Edge now is a speaker series that is on its 12th year, right? Um, um, and the founding members were uh, uh, Marco Abel, that is over there, and, and Roland, that is over there. Um, um, and I believe that, that the idea of Humanities on the Edge, um, the name of it, right, uh, had two, 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 two meanings. On the one hand, the fact that um, humanities are on an edge in the sense of on a crisis too, right? Um, we are in a moment that we only have to turn on the radio to see how the work we do in the humanities, right, um, has big enemies, right? Um, um, especially in this neoliberal age of crisis in which colleges become more expensive every year and the work of we, that we do is constantly at odds with powers that seem so big, right? Um, um, um. The other sense of the of humanities on the edge of that title was on to think about the cutting edge, right? Who are um, um, the scholars, the thinkers, the the the, the 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 intellectuals that are pushing forward our disciplines in order to imagine, right? The future of human expressions, right? Uh, the, uh, the, 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 the world of the generations to come, right? As we interpret our present. Um, Humanities on the Edge has lived up to that mission. Over 12 years, over 40 scholars from all around the world. And you can find us in, the, in our YouTube page where we have recorded our uh, uh, visitors um, some of the leading intellectuals from all over the world, world pushing the envelope, thinking about the future. Um, um, as part of the Humanities uh, uh, team, we don't have her here because she's a distinguished um, a professor in another university this year, Janette Lynn Jones from History too is part of the team. Um, and only very recently, um, I wish I could take credit, but, but, but I only joined Humanities on the Edge, uh, a year and a half ago, um, and I've been trying right, to, to bring Latin American scholars to humanities on the edge, eh, 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 eh. and also about six months, although COVID time is different, right? We don't remember how much time. <laughs> eh, Erin Hannas from the Sheldon Museum joined us too, and that is our team. Uh, I, our, every year, Humanities on the Edge has a different theme. Um, for the year, a theme that we think is provocative and that, and that matters, that is, shows that our work is important in our world. Um, this year's theme is a world of migrants, displacement, decoloniality, necrocapitalism. Um, and although we always have only one thing per year, since COVID, a lot of our talks were postponed, so we're extending from last year. Um, the idea of this topic, right, that, that we came together with this topic as a theme, but also other professors that are here, like Nora Peterson, help us um, choose that theme because it was also part of, a, of, a, of an internal um, theme that we were having in the Modern Languages programs. Um, the idea was that we're seeing in our world massive migrations, you know, from the global south to the north, north, people being displaced because of war, poverty, exploitation, and particularly climate change. Um, um, and this is unprecedented. And the unjust global distribution of wealth, right, is producing those massive displacements. And we felt that we needed a new consciousness, okay, in order to affirm life in that world of migrants. 
a new theoretical framework beyond the perhaps outdated notion of nation and state. Um, and for that, we felt that it's us as humanities intellectuals that are responsible right, to imagine that new consciousness for the future. Uh, two years ago already, the last presidential event that we have, what was the Tijuana philosopher, Sayac Valencia, last semester we had the Mexican novelist, Cristina Rivera Garza, and also from, the, from Tamaulipas, from the border. And, and today we have Sergio Delgado, uh, that is from Tijuana. So we have kept it in the border for the last three events. We think that it's in the border, that, that it's studying the border of the US-Mexico, that we are going to find that new uh, consciousness. On November, we have um, another event with Ramon Grossfogel from the University of uh, California in Berkeley. I mean, he was one of the, 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 the most important first um, 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 intellectuals of what is called the, the colonial theory, right? And we're very happy to have him. He's from Puerto Rico, and he's going to talk about Caribbean migrants in the U.S. Um, um, and the challenge that that presupposes it once again to our consciousness. Next semester, we will also continue with the topic with two talks with the philosopher uh, uh, Thomas Ney and the anthropologist Anna Arabundan Kesson. Um, it is my pleasure now to be introducing uh, to you Dr. Sergio Delgado Moya, one of Honestly, one of the most intelligent people I know, don't tell you, I mean, he's listening to me saying that, and now he's going to use it against me. Um, Sergio's work um, uh, researches the, 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 the archive of experimental and avant garde aesthetics in Latin America. Rather than focusing on how capitalism changes art, which is what a lot of scholars do, his work focuses on the contrary, right? um, 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 on, on, on how art uh, uh, changes capitalism, right? not how capitalism changes art, but how uh, art changes ca capitalism. Um, um, it is not even that, that art resists or combats capitalism in the work of Delgado, right? it, but it's how art transforms it, transforms it. Right? and transforms his alienating and destructive qualities. Um, reading his work, we become convinced that art is a major player in the battle for a new, in a battle in the realm of consciousness. And that battle for the power in the realm of consciousness, that, that is a quote from Marx, and I'm quoting Marx there because Sergio quotes Marx a lot in his work, but he's always fighting with Marx. Why do you fight with Marx so much, Sergio? Um, um, and it is <laughs> a visceral empathy, and you know, that would, cheap psychoanalysis would tell you that, which we fight too much, you know. Um, visceral empathy and delirious consumption are two of the concepts he has coined to describe the processes by which art changes our consciousness in the age of capitalism. Sergio is from Tijuana, as I said, the crossing of the border was a regular experience for him. He then studied at the University of California in Berkeley, where he got his BA. He went on to um, do his PhD in Princeton, when I had the privilege of meeting him. Um, um, later on, he taught in Harvard for, for, for five or, or six years, and he's now associate professor of Latin American Studies at Emory University in Atlanta. He's the author of a wonder, that wonderful piece of scholarship uh, titled Delirious Consumption, Aesthetics and Consumer Capitalism in Mexico and Brazil. And most recently, uh, he is an Andy Warhol Fellow for the book that he's working on that he's going to present about today um, um, on sensationalism. Um, it is then uh, my absolute pressure, pleasure to, to present you, Sergio, and uh, please join me in welcoming um, Sergio Delgado.
I'm meeting with today. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, it's been a very challenging year for, for most of us, for all of us, I dare say. Um, and one of the, 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 great, um, the great little joys uh, that we as scholars have um, is taking chances and opportunities to go out and, and meet people like you, um, scholars, those interested in, in the arts and in the sciences, students, scholars in the making, and everyone who sort of converges in the university. And I'm really grateful to be here today, and I'm really grateful that you could make it too. I want to start by thanking the organizers of, of this series, Humanities on the Edge. I had the good fortune of spending some time reviewing some of the lectures of the speakers who've been part of the series, and I'm truly honored to be included in such an expansive and incisive selection of scholars who have joined the series over the years. I thank you very much for, for organizing and for extending this invitation to me. I want to thank in particular the staff, the donors, and the faculty members who are involved in making this uh, series happen. Uh, in particular, I'd like to thank Marco Abel, Roland Bexo, um, Aaron Hannes, uh, my dear friend Otoniel Rosa, and Jeanette Jones for all their involvement and all the work they have put in the organization of this series. And I also want to thank, uh, give out a special thanks to the graduate students who joined me earlier today for a conversation that took place about two hours before this series. We started uh, sharing some ideas about the things I'm going to talk about. Um, so I feel like a I feel warmed up for the, for the lecture. I play, uh, I play tennis with some regularity, and oftentimes we play even better if we have a chance to warm up with a, a willing and, and, and joyful partner, and I feel that the graduate students who were present today for that conversation really helped me to sort of, to get in the mind frame um, that, that I'm grateful to be in right now. So thank you to all of you who were present earlier. I, um, I'm going to change the, the screen to, put up a presentation for you. Just one second. Okay. So, um, I'd like to, to, to start with a few introductory remarks. Um, much of the work I've done and the, the bulk of the work that I'm doing right now revolves around question of questions of how meaning gets communicated in mass media in newspapers, in magazines, in radio, and in television, in the content produced for these platforms, and also in the advertisements that sustain these same platforms. For the last several years, and as part of a, a book uh, I'm currently writing titled A Nervous Archive, I've focused my attention on a distinctive type of print media, crime tabloids, which were very popular throughout the Latin American region, in the second half of the 20th century. The remarks I'd like to share with you today emerge from this project I just mentioned and revolve around one such crime tabloid titled Alarma, Unicamente la Verdad. This tabloid was published in Mexico from the 1960s and well into the 21st century. And during the decades when it was produced, Alarma was tremendously popular. It left an indelible mark in the generations who constituted its readership and witnessed its popularity. It also left an indelible mark in a generation of artists and writers in both Mexico and in what we call Greater Mexico, who used this tabloid as a source of references, as a source of stories, and as a source of materials for their own work. One distinctive fact about this tabloid that speaks to the series that brings us together is that this tabloid, though it was produced in Mexico, it circulated not just in Mexico, but also in cities like Los Angeles, where Spanish-speaking Mexican and Mexican-American readers followed the stories in the tabloid with interest. Among these LA-based readers of the crime tabloid Alarma, a group stands out, a collective, of four young people who mobilized as high school students in the 1970s to protest the treatment of Chicanos and Chicanas in the hands of the Los Angeles Police Department, and who later joined forces as the four founding members of the art collective known as ASCO. ASCO means disgust in, in English. 
Now, um, there's a few steps in the presentation I prepared for you today that will hopefully help me clarify what I mean by the title of my talk today, The Transduction of After. Hopefully these steps will also help um, you how this concept is actualized in the work of the art collective that I'll be focusing today, the collective known as ASCU. I'd like to begin with a few remarks on what scholars before me have characterized as the transmission of affect, and how my own suggested term, the transduction of affect, adds to the work that has already been done and that I, um, that I use as the foundation for, for my remarks today. After that, I'd like to draw an overview of this collective, the collective known as ASCO, and the kinds of work they produce as Chicano children of Chicanos, Chicanas, and Mexican-American immigrants living in the Los Angeles area in the 1970s and in the 1980s. I'll be emphasizing three different types of work by these collectives relevant for our discussion today. Their work with crime tabloids, like the one I just mentioned, their work with television, and their work with something they called the No Movies. I'll end my presentation, if I have time, <laughs> with a brief overview of what something like a progressive appropriation of disgust might look like, and how this kind of appropriation is modeled for us in the works by the collective known as Disgust, known as ASCO. So I'll end the presentation uh, with some remarks about this notion of disgust, uh, which will be central throughout my presentation. Now, a point I want to make has to do with what I think might be the need for strong negative feelings, feelings like revulsion and disgust, feelings that I'd like to present to you as necessary for both undoing the world to violence and oppression we live in and for constructing life-affirming, love-nurturing, desire-driven worlds, the worlds all of us want to live in when we feel attuned to what is alive inside us, what pushes us, what pushes us to change and adapt as the life that carries on through us finds new forms new ways to persist. So in sum, what I'd like to propose today, what I'd like to try to persuade you about today, is the need for these very strong, very negative feelings, very negative affects, affects like disgust and revulsion, and the making of these new life-affirming worlds. So let's start. What is the transmission of affects? The plain meaning of a few expressions in everyday language in English helps us stay attuned to ways in which affect travels from one person to another. We talk about infectious laughter, we talk about contagious energy, we talk about contagious crying, and when we talk about these things, we recognize something that may feel unnatural when we verbalize it, but that we feel natural every time it happens. Laughter travels from one person to another. So does joy, so does crying, and so does disgust. Feminist scholars writing on psychoanalysis, on emotions, and on the crossroads of the psychoanalytic clinic, politics, and aesthetics have already set down the basic conceptual frameworks necessary for the study of affect and emotion as transmissible intersubjective forces, as things that happen between and across subjects, as energetic events that are not limited to, that do not begin or end in any one of us, in any one individual. Another way of saying this is that these scholars, people like Jessica Benjamin, Teresa Brennan, Sara Ahmed, and Sueli Holniki, among others, all depart from a kind of Freudian premise of the individual psyche as the starting point, the origin of the drive and the affix. I subscribe to this view, and I invite you to keep it in mind as I move, for as I move forward with my presentation today. Sueli Holniki, uh, the Brazilian scholar uh, and psychoanalyst in particular, draws a clear cartography of a world as it seems when we acknowledge it is crossed by forces, by affects. In this cartography, in this kind of worldview, there is a place, a need for forms, forms like the outline of our bodies, for instance, and forms like the shape of the objects around us. We need those forms, they keep us sane. But there is also a place, and there is also a need for drives and forces that travel through these forms, disturbing them and forcing their internal arrangement 
as well as their constitution, outside of their boundaries. According to Romniki, display on forms on things like our bodies and forces things like our feelings is what keeps us responsive to our environments. By contrast, when we insist on remaining impervious to the shock of forces, impervious to the shock of feelings and emotions, this leads us to a disconnection from the world as it is actualized now in every moment. Repeated, reiterated denials of the kind of changes and adjustments forces and feelings demand from us when they cross our bodies, when they cross our form, eventually leads to decaying us. It leads to death. Bodies, both individual and social, that are unable or unwilling to respond to the forces that cross them. Bodies, both social and individual, that do not rise to the task life imposes on them through the transformational power of feelings and forces cannot sustain the life in them, nor can they nurture the life around them. Worst, when these bodies, individual and social, insist on closing themselves and their environment off from the transformational power of feelings, of affects, of forces, these bodies, regardless of whether they're individual or social, end up, intentionally or unintentionally, spreading decay around them. They rot, and they spread rot around them. The alternative, to remain open to the forces in the world, to the drives and the feelings and the affects that cross the world, is from a psychic and from a clinical perspective a necessary condition for the continuation of life. But this alternative has consequences that are radical and disturbing, too disturbing perhaps, for most of us to confront as a matter of truth, as a matter of habit. To remain open to the forces in the world, including feeling and affect, does not just mean that we are aware of these forces. It means taking in those forces, allowing them to affect us as more than an object of contemplation, more than an object of our perception. In a sense, and this is what Teresa Brennan makes the case for in her groundbreaking book on the transmission of affect, to remain open, consciously or not, to the forces, the feelings, the affects in the world entails experiencing things that do not seem to belong to us, that seem to belong to others. It means experiencing things that don't sit well with us and with the forms we've developed to negotiate the world. To remain open to the forces in the world, to the affects and the feelings in the world, entails then, in plain but perhaps misleading language, the possibility of feeling someone else's feelings and dealing with the consequences that this brings to us. Now, how can someone feel someone else's feelings? More precisely, how can someone feel someone else's affects? This is, this is the question Teresa Brennan poses at the beginning of her book. She starts not by wondering, but by assuming that we are capable of sensing affects that do not originate in us, that don't belong to us. In words that echo Gloria and Salua, uh, the groundbreaking Latina philosopher, Brennan asks, and I quote, is there anyone who has not, at least once, walked into a room and felt the atmosphere? Grief, anxiety, nervousness, anger. These are the kind of things we can feel, the kind of things some of us often feel, when we walk into a room full of others. These are the type of affects that can be transmitted and whose transmission Brennan sets out to understand. Her purpose is specific, ambitious. What Brennan wants to argue is that, the, is that the transmission of affect, though social and psychological, is also responsible for physical, biochemical, and neurological changes in all the sentient beings implicated in the chain of transmission of affect. What Brennan wants to claim, in short, is, the is that the transmission of feelings, the transmission of affect, is an objective event, 
in as much as it is, or to the extent that it is, a subjective one. Put another way, the effects of this transmission of something generally taught to be psychological or touchy-feely are real, they're physical, they're measurable, they're objective. The stakes of recognizing this transmission in these terms are significant, perhaps even radical. A world where affect is transmitted as a social and psychological event and as a physical event is a world where emotions and energies are not held within autonomous subjects, within self-contained individuals. Now, what is the transduction of affect, on the other hand? I want to build on this theory of the transmission of affect I just summarized for you by focusing on an implication of this theory that has already been explored to some extent by Sara Ahmed uh, Brennan, whom I just quoted, and Sodi Holnik, among others. An implication that can perhaps be elaborated further as we seek to understand the place of feelings and the place of affect and the working of the world around us. The implication I want to explore is that when we transmit affects, when feelings get transmitted from one person to another, this does not simply constitute a form of travel from one person to another, from one form to another, from one body to another. It, imp it implicates something else. This does not happen without leaving the beings implicated in the transmission of affect in the same state that they were before being involved in affect transmission. The implication I want to explore is the idea that affect does not simply transmit, it transforms, or to use a related and I hope more revealing term, it transduces. It's helpful to understand, or to begin with, a, with the dictionary, that's where I often start. In English, uh, the simplest and oldest meanings of this word transduction refer to the act of leading something or bringing it across from one place to another. In this sense, transduction shares much in common with uh, traducción uh, or traduction, a relatively rare word in English uh, whose Spanish cognate traducción is used wisely to uh, widely to describe the transference, the conveyance, the transmission entailed by the act of translation. So in English, transduction just used to mean translation. Uh, that meaning has been uh, more or less lost. More recently though, and these are the meanings um, I'd like us to, to keep in mind, transduction has acquired specialized meaning in genetics and in physiology. The way the term is used in these fields can enrich our own sense of it, of the term transduction, to describe the transference of feelings, the transference of affect, across different subjects and across different objects. In the field of genetics, transduction refers to the process of transference of genetic material that takes place between two separate bacteria and that it is facilitated by a virus. In this process, a virus using a bacterium as its host can remove part of that bacterium's DNA and later insert that portion of DNA into a different bacterium's genetic code. The process effectively introduces genetic code from one organism to another organism without the need for direct contact between those two organisms. So in short, um, this process, which sounds very simple, is actually quite extraordinary, even magical. There's a possibility of genetic material trans, um, uh, trans being transmitted or traveling between two different entities without those entities even touching each other. And once that genetic material travels from one entity to another, the entity receiving that DNA, receiving that message, so to speak, changes its whole genetic composition. So again, quite extraordinary. In physiology, transduction or sensory transduction is the process by which energy received by an organism in the form of sensory stimulus is converted into action potentials, integrated into the nervous system, and then processed as a sensory response or action. Different sensory systems, visual, auditory, olfactory, somosensatory, have different transduction mechanisms and pathways. 
through each of these mechanisms and in each of these pathways. The same effective, seemingly magical transference of energy takes place from one place to another, from a sensory event to a physiological response, from an act producing stimulus to a stimulus appropriate action. A sense, a feeling, an affix that belongs to someone or originates somewhere, travels, transmits, passes on to someone or to something else, and in the process, to transform them. So, same idea, but as it relates to sense perception. Now, what I mean to say when I use this term, the term, the transduction of affect, is modeled after the meaning transduction has in physiology, but especially in genetics. With this term, what I want to signal is the fact that affect not only travels from being to being, from person to person, but that when affect travels, when feelings travel from person to person, these feelings, this affect, has the capacity to change, to transform everyone implicated in the chain of transmission. What I want to keep us attuned to is that when something like sadness, something like joy, something like disgust travels from one being to another, from one person to another, there is a chance that those implicated in this transmission will be changed in their composition, in their very essence, in their DNA, so to speak. What is more, and in line with the meaning of transduction as used in the field of genetics, this process of transmission and the consequent transformation that can take place, takes place without the need for contact between those involved, between those transformed by the transmi transmission of feelings. And whereas in genetics, something like a virus is what makes possible the transduction of genes and the subsequent modification of beings, when it comes to feelings, when it comes to affect, the transduction between two separate beings can be said to take place by means of other kinds of signals, more symbolic kind of signals. Things like images, for instance. Things like viral images, for instance. Verbal images, then, visual images, performative images. These are images that elicit an effective reaction, images that sometimes transform those who receive them. These are the kind of images that the Asco Collective produce in their attempt to transmit something to their audience, in their attempt to transform themselves and their audience in the production of these images. So, uh, what is ASCO, or who are the members of ASCO? ASCO developed over the years, over about 15, 20 years of active collective work, and through those 15, 20 years, um, there was a number of different members um, uh, numbering in the dozens. But there were four founding members of this collective work, whose, um, whose images and whose work I'd like to highlight today. Gronk, Patsy Valdez, Willy Herron III, and Harry Gamboa Jr. These are key references now in the history of Chicano culture. A major exhibition of their work at the LACMA, the Los Angeles Museum of Art, highlighted the importance of their work for the understanding not just of Chicano art, but of US art as a whole from the second half of the 20th century. The collective work, and I'd like to stress this, uh, completed by these um, for young people was completed under the name of OSCO, the Spanish name for nausea, revolt, and disgust. Now, the members of OSCO deployed disgust in an effort to move, to move themselves first and foremost into some kind of action, and to move others out of complacency, out of stupor, and into transformative change. Affect, of course, and disgust in particular, has this ability, the ability to move the ability to drive someone into action. The, the name the members chose for their collective seems to have arisen out of recognition of the power with which disgust moves. In an interview with the group from 1983, we learned that their repulsive reactions from the people who saw these works is what brought the name to their mind. Disgust is what audiences would say they felt when they confronted the early works by this collective the members of the collective picked up on this frequent response, and the name stuck. 
the feeling behind the name, the feeling of cultivated repulsion and directing disgust, characterizes much of their collective work. And here I want to stress, these were high school students when they begun um, this kind of uh, organized collective work. And by the time they started doing the work that I'll be discussing today, they were just about as old as many of our older undergraduate um, uh, students here, and as old as many of our graduate students here. This choice of name, disgust, and the spirit this name brought to the works produced by Asko turned out to be remarkably powerful. Because of its invasiveness and the strength of the action it drives, disgust is singularly cutting, and the works Asko produced as they channeled this negative affect turned out to be just as incisive. Disgust contaminates, and I think all of us have felt that. It moves because it contaminates. It is not just that an object that causes disgust, a thing, a person, or an event that gives rise to disgust, comes across as potentially contaminating. By the time we feel disgust, it is already too late. We've already been sickened by the object of disgust, by its sight and its smell, by its texture, and so contaminated by it. The profound aversion that comes from disgust rest on this kind of intrusion, on this loathsome intimacy, this feeling that whatever is causing disgust is not just, no longer just outside of us. It is already somehow inside us, upper nose, inner stomach. Though playful and youthful, and they were playful and youthful, even though making them sound very stern, <laughs> Asco Collective, their members were also very glamorous, they were also very ironic, and they were funny. The members of Disgust deployed, the members of Asco deployed Disgust and negative affect for specific purposes. They wanted to denounce the social harms that visited upon their communities and to work through destructive forms of violence that afflicted particular members of the group. Gun and gang violence, drug misuse, Latino deaths in the Vietnam War, as many of you know, uh, Latinos disproportionately died in the battlefronts, the battle lines of the Vietnam War, and numbers that did not reflect either um, their participation in the army or their percentage of, of the population in the United States. Domestic violence, all these kinds of violence were very much present in the minds of the members of OSCO as they went about their collective work in the 1970s and in the 1980s. Performance was a common instrument of expression of most of their production, an instrument that all members of the OSCO collective had a chance at home as active participants in the Chicano movement and the Chicano public protest that took place in Los Angeles in the 1960s and in the 1970s. Among their first uh, performances, protest performances, um, was a procession that was organized during Christmas Day that consisted in the members of our school disguising themselves as figures of the nativity in a very sort of, um, uh, uh, in a very sort of um, attention grabbing and kind of freak way. They carried a cross made out of cardboard and they dropped the cross in front of the recruitment center uh, for the army that was visibly open uh, in the very center of the most heavily Latino populated area of downtown Los Angeles. That's the kind of work that they were doing. Protests and other forms of exhibitionism for the purpose of political mobilization is what set down the basis of what will become the performances of Oxbow. And here it becomes important, I think, to understand the genealogy of performance of this kind of performance, of critical ethnic performance, in the ways Coco Fusco and Jose Esteban Munoz teaches us to understand it. Not in Dada, not in surrealism, or in any other modernist origin story, but in the tactical and coerced, coerced performances that captured, enslaved, and oppressed subjects have been performing for colonial power for centuries now. So the point here is that as we sort of think in a more sort of art historical way of what Asco is and what kind of art they were doing, if we're going to call their art performance and we're going to look for precursors to that art, we should resist the temptation to somehow inscribe them in a modernist uh, lineage of performance art that goes back to something like that by surrealism. And instead we should look to this kind of performance, the performance 
um, the real activists, the people on the ground in the streets, were organizing in the 1960s and before that, deploying things like visibility, dress, performance, um, not for uh, inscription in any kind of uh, art history, but for the purpose of, of change, of social change. The morbid stages of bodily subjected, of bodily subjection erected by colonial power thus emerge as the more generative precursors of the kind of political performance produced by Oscar. To this point, Willy Caron, founding member of the collective, says the following about his first performance of the group. This is what Willy Caron says when they ask him, what was your first performance for Asco? The first Asco performance I remember, recounts Caron, was when I was jumped and crowbarred on McBride and Whittier Boulevard. Then I walked leading to the Los Angeles Emergency, which is no longer in existence on Arizona Street. End of quote. So, in the interview, that comes across as funny, but that is powerful. You're asking an artist, what is your first performance? What is your first work of performance art? And his answer is, my first work of performance art was that one time I was jumping the street and I walked leading to a hospital that no longer exists in Los Angeles. It's, a, it's, it's, it's pretty wild, but it's, it's pretty funny. <laughs> now, let me move on to the kind of work that this collective, the Osco Collective, was doing with its media. Uh, and through this, I hope to show how they were using disgust to kind of shape the kind of conversations they were trying to shape. I'll start with them. Uh, the work they were doing with tablets, with things like prime tablets. Um, early, and just uh, as a sort of note, What's a crime tablet? So, uh, as, as, as all of you know, a tablet is a form of newspaper. It has a certain kind of format. It's not quite, it doesn't open like a regular sort of issue of a newspaper. It almost functions like a magazine. It's a little larger and it's often associated with forms of journalism that are very inexpensive, that are very cheap, and that are often said to be of no value or of no worth. In the United States, we have a, a very um, visible kind of tabloid. That's the National Enquirer. Um, the crime tablets that I'm talking about look like that, but they're fundamentally different. They focus more on covering crime events as they happen in a local population. So when I say crime tabloid, what I want you to have in mind is a newspaper that, again, is very inexpensive. It's associated with a form of journalism that's a little flaky, a little lewd, a little manipulative. Um, and in Latin America, very, very local, focused on local crime events that happen in a particular uh, city or a particular town. Early ASCO performances, especially the ones that deal explicitly with violence, blur the line between stage events and events as they unfold in everyday life. It is in these performances, the ones that grapple with everyday violence and Chicano life in Los Angeles, that the dialogue between ASCO artists and crime tabloids become more explicit. No other popular print medium in modern print culture channels and exploits the range of negative affects, things like anger, fear, anxiety, sadness, and disgust, with the frequency and efficacy that crime tabloids do. The most emblematic kind of sensationalist publication in Latin America, modern print culture, is the crime tabloid. What you have on the screen here is, on the left side, a photo novel that was a spin-off of the most popular crime tabloid in Mexico, Caso de Alarma. So on the left side, you have a photo novel. These are not very common now, but imagine something like a comic. Instead of drawing, so what you have are photos representing the images in this story. It's a format that was very popular in the second half of the 20th century in Latin America, and that is, uh, it's no longer as popular. In the second half of the 20th century, in places like Mexico and in Los Angeles, these kinds of tabloids were tremendously popular. Uh, I'll give you an example. In a place like Mexico in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and up to the 1980s, 90s, and up to the 2010s, and up to this day, the newspapers that cover crime, things like crime tabloids, the three more popular ones, publish three times the number of issues that the national newspapers publish. So these are tabloids, even though they might look you know, very weird and, you know, kind of unusual. These are print publications that, especially in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, they were circulating widely, massively, to a point that no national newspaper could even imagine circulating. These were tremendously popular crime tablets. Well into this century, the 21st century, 
these kinds of tabloids remain popular. Uh, scholars working in anthropology in Mexico City bring our attention to the fact that to this day, the readers of these kinds of publications, the ones on the left, still constitute the vast majority of readers in places like Mexico. And I want to stress this because even though we might not be as aware of these kinds of publications, um, readers, community of readers in places like Mexico and places like Los Angeles and places like Colombia and Chile will identify this kind of reading as the, their most habitual kind of reading. Now, how do prime tabloids work? In Latin America and elsewhere, the wild popularity of crime tabloids is both a symptom and an effect of something fascinating and something frequently misunderstood. Something that is also, strangely for some of us, um, something of a feared phenomenon. The emergence of mass communities of readers. The crime tabloid consumed and referenced by the Ospo collective, Alarma, and the photo novel they also reference, Casos de Alarma, emerged precisely around the time that literacy campaigns uh, in Mexico start yielding results. What I want to point out here is that these crime tabloids, they are both the result uh, and they feed into a fact that um, literacy campaigns made possible, the emergence of huge community of readers and numbers that in places like Mexico and Colombia and Chile had not ever been seen before the 1940s and before the 1950s. So around those years, around the 1940s and around the 1950s, these kinds of tabloids start circulating among a new community of newly minted readers, so to speak. Generations of people who did not have access to literacy, and when they do get access, they start consuming these kinds of, of publications. Now, a set of expectations starts to emerge um, between the readers of these tabloids and the tabloids themselves. A set of expectations begin to be molded in this back and forth between publications such as crime tabloids and the readers that sustain these print publications. And despite the more or less generalized consensus that exists in educated circles about what, time, what crime tabloids are and what their value is, Recent studies from the social sciences about the readership of crime tabloids in Latin America complicates our judgments of what these crime tabloids are in ways that resonate with the kind of work that ASCO was doing. Now, these crime tabloids, and this is the consensus uh, among a large number, not just of scholars, but of the sort of general educated public. The consensus is that these type of uh, crime tabloids, they're really, they might be entertaining and there might be um, sort of uh, thrilling and fascinating, but they're worthless. They're, they're really not sort of, they're, they're not uh, of any kind of value. Um, they're certainly not worth of, of any kind of um, serious study. And they also um, constitute, according to this consensus, a very strong and powerful tool of manipulation. What these crime tabloids do is sort of um, teeter the attention, teeter the, the fascination of readers in order to attract them. Um, and in a way that manipulates these readers. Now, as I said, recent studies in social sciences are starting to complicate our view of these crime tabloids and how they work. In an ethnographic study of readers of La Cuarta, the most popular crime tabloid published in Chile during the years of the Augusto Pinochet dictatorship, Guillermo Suncal draws our attention to the way a term like sensationalism um, is used among readers of the tablet. Now, sensationalism is a term that we use when we're talking about these kinds of publications. And it's a kind of a shorthand that helps us to distinguish between a certain kind of journalism that we value for being factual and for being substantive and for being responsible, and another kind of journalism, sensationalist journalism, that we dismiss for being too bloody or too lewd or not factual enough or somehow irresponsible about the work that they do in journalism. Now, what Guillermo Sunca found out in his work with the leadership of this one crime tabloid in Chile is that this term, sensationalism, has no use, it has no valiance, so to speak, among the actual readers of the tabloid. When these readers were asked to describe what the tabloid was like, when they were asked to describe what something like this photo novel uh, represented for them, the kind of words that came to mind were words like uh, factual, representative, 
and somehow uh, in proximity to the realities that the readers were living. So again, uh, when the social scientist goes out there in the field, so to speak, and asks people, how do you feel about this uh, crime tabloid? How do you feel about this tabloid newspaper that focuses on crime? Readers insist on highlighting the veracity of this crime tabloid, the way in which this crime tabloid captures their own reality. Now, that term sensationalist is used and does have value, but it has value among people like us. We're the ones who use the term sensationalist to describe this crime tabloid, but not the readers of the actual, um, of the actual, uh, of the actual tabloid. Now, um, as Sunko argues, what seems to be at work in this difference, what seems to be at work in this perception of veracity, this attribution of truth that the readers of the tabloid give to the tabloid, is a way of listening or a way of reading a community of readers who believe in the tabloid's ability to convey um, truth factually. And to do that, not by avoiding the explicit representation of violence, but by focusing on the explicit representation of violence. Readers with access to higher education and socially privileged readers, on the other hand, more, more generally tend to find no such value in these kinds of publications. This is what Eduardo Nibon Bolan, a scholar working on the Mexican side of tabloid publications, finds in his study of the reading practices and preferences of social groups scattered across the economic and educational spectrum. Now, Nibon Bolivar, uh, he presents us with yet another example of how this sort of divide um, how this divide takes place. And here, I'm going to put up a quote in Spanish for those of you uh, who can and would like to read it in Spanish, but I'll walk um, all of us through the point that Eduardo Nimón Bolívar wants to make um, uh, as part of my presentation. Uh, Nimón Bolívar, like Sunkel, is interested in exploring the seeming division, on the one hand, of those who believe that crime tabloids have no value, that they're just lewd and sensationalist, and on the other hand, the perception of those readers who actually consume the tabloid and who describe the value of the tabloid as being factual and as being representative. Uh, Nibon Bolivar arrives uh, at much the same conclusions that Guillermo Sunto does in the context of Chile, but he presents this one anecdote that I thought was very powerful of this, this kind of difference that they're both exploring. So they're both talking about crime tabloids and the way they're perceived differently by these two groups of readers. And he finds this one young man in particular, a man of sort of a middle class, upper middle class upbringing, who was in contact with his family and who had a problem with misuse of drugs. Um, this young man, because uh, of his misuse of drugs, uh, was living sort of on and off the street. Uh, he would spend days, weeks at a time, living out in the streets, and he developed a lot of friendships with people in the street. But he was also in touch with his family. He died of a drug overuse um, about 10 years ago, and um, uh, the day after he died, a funeral was held uh, to honor him. To that funeral, um, two groups of people um, were present. On one side of the room, so to speak, there was his family. Again, members of a, a middle class, upper middle class family in Mexico were mourning the, the, the death of this young man. But then his friends from the street uh, slowly started uh, arriving too. Uh, and they started occupying the other half of the room, so to speak. Now, at one point during the funeral, um, a crime tabloid, like the one I just showed you, started circulating, and that crime tabloid was reporting on the death of this young man. Uh, when the voice sort of started spreading, and there was a crime tabloid representing the death of the same young man who was in the room, two different reactions arose in the same room. On the one hand, on the side of the family who was mourning the death of their own son, a very um, understandable, from a certain point of view, uh, alarm and shock emerge that a magazine, a uh, cheap magazine, a uh, lewd magazine, a crime tabloid, was circulating with the story of the death of their own son. So there was shock um, and there was um, repulsion at the fact that this magazine was circulating in the very funeral. But on the other side of the room, among the friends of this young man who had just died, a certain kind of excitement started to emerge. Excitement because their friend, their friend who had died on the streets of a drug overuse, was being made visible in a publication that thousands of readers were reading at the same time. Not only that, but 
the group of uh, drug misusers and uh, people living in the streets that were there in the funeral started to talk about how this magazine helped them understand other deaths just like that. So keep in mind that those two very different reactions as the kind of um, uh, communities of reading that these social sciences want us to, to keep in mind. Now, with that difference and keeping in mind those two sides of the room, what I want to ask you is, how did this difference come about? How does one crime tablet get to be perceived so differently, on the one hand by educated uh, middle and upper middle class readers, and on the other hand by readers who have some kind of marginal or vulnerable situation? Or rather, what do we learn about structures of knowledge and structures of power when we inquire about the social and historical differences underpinning the differences between these two communities? How is it that one reading community, wealthier and more educated, perceive crime tabloids as manipulative and deceitful, lewd and sensationalist, while another reading community, poorer, less educated, more vulnerable, perceives the same kind of publication as factual and representative? Sensibilities, as we know, like every exterior and interior thing around us, have a history. They are socially molded, culturally shaped, economically determined. As such, our perspectives about what constitutes a more or less exploitative, a more or less ethical framing of violence ought to take into account not just the known or presumed perspective of those victimized by violence, but also, and more importantly, the prejudices and blind spots that play into our own judgment of what is right and what is wrong with publications like Alarma and their way of framing both violence and the popular, marginal, often female, often effeminate, always poor, and always marginalized subjects who are affected by that violence and portrayed in these publications. The dominant characterization of crime tabloids like Alarma takes the exploitative, manipulative, and more or less worthless nature of these kinds of publications as a natural fact. Further inquiry into these publications makes necessary the kind of critical appropriation of crime tabloids performed by Alarma. It compels us to revisit this characterization and figure out which structures of knowledge, which structures of power are benefiting by the wholesale dismissal and condemnation of these kinds of publications. Now, one thing that becomes clear, at least to me, upon further analysis of these publications and the readings communities that either embrace or reject these publications is that, unintentionally or not, the negative framing of the subjects who appear in these publications, performed by the producers of these publications, ends up being perpetuated by educated readers, by those of us who insist on believing that when it comes to these publications, there is nothing there to redeem, nothing there to see, but exploitative violence and manipulation. In other words, what becomes clear to me is that the kind of violence that is performed on the subjects that are violently pictured in these publications is perpetuated by those of us who choose to those miss those publications and further condemn them to a kind of silence. The whole frame of negative characterizations actively deployed by crime tabloids when they portray female, effeminate, poor, and marginalized subjects as shameful, repulsive, marginal, and worthless is perpetuated when the print media that most consistently covers the lives of these subjects, however abusively, is dismissed without further inquiry about the ways in which these tabloids constitute an immense archive, however problematic that archive is. And here, I'm getting to a point that I hope to develop further um, in the book um, that I'm writing, in a point, it's also a point that I discussed with um, some of the graduate students that I met with earlier. The point I'd like to make here is that these sort of prime tabloids, um, they're very exploitative um, and um, they're, very, they're very sort of abusive. But when you start to wonder, for instance, what the everyday life of a drug misuser um, or a queer subject, a homosexual, a lesbian, or a poor marginalized woman uh, in a city like Mexico City was, and you start to wonder what their lives were in an everyday kind of um, register in 
the 1950s or the 1960s or the 1970s, you might go to the newspapers, the national newspapers, to see how much information you can find. And the answer is just about zero. There's no portraits, there's no stories, there's no names, there's no coverage, there's no mention of anyone who was poor, marginalized, effeminate, or otherwise vulnerable, except as a kind of number, except as a kind of cipher. However abusive these crime tabloids are, there are portraits, there are stories, and there are names in these kinds of tabloids. And in this sense, they constitute a vast archive. An archive that I'm trying to understand as problematic, but also useful as we try to sort of read through this archive for the stories that are not to be found anywhere else in journalism of the period. The use of the same kind of crime tabloids, the use of this nervous archive by artists like the members of ASCO constitutes an opportunity, I think, or rather, it presents a responsibility for us to understand how these tabloids are read and mediated by the reading communities that consume them. The shame of belonging, so to speak, in the pages of a tabloid is emphatically appropriated and disseminated among the members of ASCO. Now, um, to conclude my remarks today, I want to, I want to, this is a picture, this is not a real dead person, by the way, that's what I saw on that guy's <laughs> tank top. So, uh, I'll be very brief. I think, uh, um, I, I want to sort of um, walk you through the implications of this, this argument I'm trying to make. So this is a this is a picture that was quite scandalous, even though it's just spaghetti sauce when it was published, because it sort of represents um, uh, this, this Latino man dying. Um, this other picture right here, this one's a little bit more complicated. It's a, a performance organized by the group. Um, when um, what they did was they asked one of the members of the group to sort of pose on the street and lay down and pretend that he was dead, and then they put up all these flares. Uh, and then they took photographs, right? And this was in the middle of sort of Chicana, Los Angeles. And they called this war uh, decoy gang war victim. Um, now, they took those photographs, this is in 1974, and then they sent these photographs to media outlets, and one TV station actually picked up the photographs and reported on the photograph as a real sort of gang uh, death. And then after reporting on that photograph, um, they, um, they sort of added that this was evidence of how dangerous and how riddled with violence Chicano communities were in Los Angeles. And what they were doing, they were basically sort of deploying shame in the way that I'm interested in describing to you as a way to characterize um, these communities. What the OSCO members did, and this is a gesture that I'm interested in presenting to you, they kind of reversed that shame because the same way that the TV station was shaming a Latino or a Chicano community for, for being too violent, the members of OSCO sort of redirected that shame and shamed the TV presenters for, first of all, doing journalism all kinds of wrong by reporting on a fake story, and second, revealing the kind of prejudice and the kind of bias that that TV station in particular and media in general were deploying um, in the face of, um, of, um, of Latino community. And this is the kind of sort of redirection or transduction of affect that I'm interested in exploring uh, with you. Uh, I'll finish my uh, presentation with this quote. This is a quote, a recent quote, by um, a couple of um, figures from uh, uh, conservative media here in the United States, um, editor Seth Barron in conversation with Tucker Carlson for Fox News. I won't read the quote, um, but what this quote does, um, in no uncertain terms, is to kind of deploy disgust and deploy shame deploy the kind of negative affects that are um, used in crime tabloids against a certain community. And I think the kind of work that ASCO is doing, um, sort of, it, it, it leads me and it leads other scholars working in legal studies to wonder whether, whether it isn't time now to consider something like a progressive appropriation of disgust. I think what the work of ASCO is showing in these very playful and very looted um, uses of disgust and shame and negative affect is making us wonder uh, the extent to which we can use those negative affect 
to extent to which we perhaps need to use those negative affects to undo those structures of oppression and undo those structures of violence. And what I mean when I said that, when I say that, is um, to, I wonder, the members of OSCO wonder, and other scholars working on the progressive appropriation of disgust wonder, we all sort of wonder whether it is in time to not only um, to, to, to not only propose a sort of positive and humanizing valuation of those communities that have been oppressed, but also and at the same time deploy the kind of powerful thought laden negative ethics and negative judgments such as uh, shame and disgust towards those structures and towards those figures that are upholding the kind of violence that afflicts migrant communities, rationalized communities, uh, Latino communities, and vulnerable communities. Thank you. So I believe we, still have, we have uh, uh, some time uh, for questions. Thank you, Sergio, for a thought-provoking uh, uh, presentation. So I'm, um, I'm, um, for the questions, if you raise your hand, I can uh, 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 bring you you're the microphone, and I can, to break the ice, I can start with a question, and maybe we can take a few later. Um, um, Sergio, the, the question of trauma, right? Um, I was going to ask you, right, because I remember Freud describes trauma also with the cell, right, with breaking the membrane, with like in a similar way that you presented the idea of, of transduction, how does uh, uh, perhaps trauma figure there until we we ask a few more questions. We have a, a, a still some some time. Harris, do you repeat that question? The question of trauma uh, uh, when when we're talking about affect, right? Um, 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 given shame and disgust, um, 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 as that connect as it connects with transduction. I was thinking, you know, um, um, um. right? Um, well, I think uh, one of the um, one of the substantial um, sort of um, one of the substantial objections um, that, that we have to consider when we talk about these things, when we talk about a very powerful but perhaps a very volatile sort of deployment of negative affects, is the way in which these kinds of negative affects um, may trigger um, those of us who have um, who have been uh, sort of subjected to traumatic events, into into feelings and into situations that that are not sort of um, that are not um, are not um, they're not they're too sensitive or sort of, sort of too powerful. And I think I'm, I'm trying to sort of um, to be mindful of, of these kinds of objections. But at the same time, um, I'm also trying to to understand a point that scholars like um, I think his name is Daniel Cahan makes uh, when, when he insists that these kinds of um, uh, situations that border on um, on trauma and on the traumatic effects that that words can have on certain people, how they're being sort of deployed for the purposes of of, of reactionary um, reactionary objectives. So I think it's it's um yeah it's it's a it's a tricky situation and, and, and it's a good question and it's something I'm trying to be mindful. Of. Um, thank you for being here. Um, I had a question. Um, so you mentioned that these tabloids were circulated for like decades. Um, through that, was the violence and oppression towards these marginalized groups um, like desensitized? Like, did, was it for the viewers and the readers? Um, right. So I think um, one of the uh, and, and one of the one of the things I, I try to be. Um, mindful of when, when I study these, these materials is to, to the extent that it is possible to, to try to think about these readers not as a sort of a monolith, um, but as a, a very sort of diversified and very singular and particular community of, of different readers, all of whom bring different kind of experiences and different kind of expectations to these kinds of publications. So I think that the short answer to your question is yes, of course, a number of readers one can safely assume, must have been desensitized to this kind of violence after seeing it time and again, week after week, 
of buying this publication. I think there's there's no doubt about that. But I think it's it's also important um, to take into account uh, that the way in which these sort of crime tablets circulate and the way in which they communicate uh, a kind of very explicit violence to their readers, it's never sort of a kind of one directional uh, uh, thing of the crime tabloid just sort of sending violent content to a reader and thereby desensitizing it. There's always something like a mediation that takes place between those readers and that tabloid, and that mediation will determine the kind of uh, the, the extent to which someone can get desensitized or not. So again, short answer is, of course, some, a number of readers must have been desensitized by this kind of violence. Um, but I think it's, it's also worth sort of um, staying open to the possibility that not all readers were desensitized, that some of them were perhaps moved by these kinds of violence and these kinds of representation of violence. And the Osco Collective is one example that we know of because they're famous artists. But we can assume that there's other examples. And the only way to know that is to do a kind of work that is often not performed in the humanities, but that is very valuable to this kind of work, which is actually talking to, to readers and seeing how they're processing, how they're understanding, how they're taking in this material, and the extent to which we can affirm whether they're desensitized to violence or not by actually talking to them and not just by assuming um, that there's a kind of generalized reaction for everyone everyone. You're Hi, thank you for coming. So, um, you talked about the crime tabloids being simultaneously representative and sensational, um, questionably factual, as well as um, sort of like showing the realities of this area. Um, so, I guess my question is how have you come to understand uh, crime tabloids as either beneficial or negative to the culture at large? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, that's a great question. Um, I think um, my, my, the way in which I'm trying to understand the value of these, these crime tabloids, uh, there's two ways to answer your question. One, I'll sort of draw on research uh, that has been completed before by the Penn Scholars Talent Society, Eduardo Nibuburan, Nessor Reza Cancini, who might have been and Guillermo Sunke. So one of the beneficial aspects of these crime tablets is they have seen, uh, based on their field work with actual readers of these tabloids, is the establishing of the kind of identification and sort of commonality and community building that we see at work with any kind of reading, not just newspaper reading, but any kind of reading. And I think all of us have sort of felt that at one point. When we find that someone else is reading what we read, it builds a connection. And it sort of, it, it presents like this constellation of shared references, sometimes um, shared reactions to what we're reading. And in that sense, it helps build links, it helps build community. Um, I think um, one would assume that there was no reason why these crown tabloids wouldn't work the same way. And according to the work of these um, social scientists, they, they do in fact work the same way. They establish that kind of commonality, that kind of sense of belonging. They do something else according to Eduardo Nibomboran, which is that they socialize information among people living in vulnerable situations regarding things like crime statistics and the level of police repression going on in a particular city at any given time. In other words, they function much like newspapers, like the New York Times function, except that they function in that sense at a much different register. Instead of giving you a picture of the world as it is today, like the New York Times tries to do, a crime tablet will give you not just a picture of a city, but a picture of a particular dimension of the city, the crime dimension of the city, as it is today in this day. And in that sense, there's value to that. Value, not universal value to all of us, but value uh, for those who um, live closer to that dimension of that particular city. So I think there's value in that sense. From my perspective, um, there's also historical value, and that's the kind of work that I'm trying to do with this book, in the sense that um, the kind of uh, the, the kind of portraits, even the kind of photographs that are published by these crime tabloids, um, they're nowhere to be found in newspapers of record, in national newspapers. The kind of stories that are found there, the kind of um, names that are found there, the kind of communities that are represented, um, are nowhere to be found in other newspapers. Now, of course, and I insist on this, the way in which poor and marginalized and queer subjects are represented in these crime tabloids 
it's very exploitative, it's very violent, and it's very manipulative. But the fact that there was a trace of this life left in those crime tabloids, from my point of view, should at least make us, make us wonder whether we can uh, revisit these kinds of publications as a kind of nervous archive. An archive that you can't just enter into, assuming you're going to get the information that you need. A kind of archive that still requires tools that we're developing now. The kind of tools that will allow us to recover some of those stories without sidelining the violence and the exploitation that made possible the preservation of those stories. So that's the value that I find in those kinds of topics. <laughs> There's a, a gender contouring to these tabloid cover images that feels incredibly compelling. And I'm wondering if you can talk about um, the ways that gender plays out in some of these cover images, as well as the, the vectors of kind of gender heightening that um, Asko might have picked up on. I mean, I think of someone like Patsy Valdez, mm -hmm. who, of course, develops her own photographic practice by like, photographing her queer friends. Mm -hmm. And so there's, you know, there, in thinking about melodrama, especially, as a potentially strong way to make an affront to these vectors of mass media violence and being a frequently used queer tool, like it, it feels like the, the kind of latent genderedness or queerness might be homeopathic to ask in a really interesting way. So I'm, I'm curious if, uh, about ways your project might explore that. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a great question. And I love um, the words you use, uh, gender contouring. I think it's a, it's a great way to think about, yeah, it's a great thing to, to think about what's happening here. I think I would add to that a, a sort of a, a, a racial or racializing contouring mm -hmm. and a class or classes contouring. This kind of outlining or contouring is taking place at different levels that intersect each other all the time and it's sort of a, in, in, in mutually affirming um, ways, and I think there, there's there's almost uh, there's a way in which we, we can start by looking at how um, the crime tabloids um, sort of tap into a gender contouring or a classist contouring um, or a racist contouring as it exists in order to publish more issues, of this, in order to make it more attractive. So what these crime tabloids do, they're they're tapping into prejudices and biases and stereotypes that we all know. Uh, for instance, the disgust that some bodies have and carry with them on account of their gender, or on account of their class, or on account of their sexuality, or on account of their migrant status. So they're just tapping into that. They're working under the assumption um, that just because you're a woman, or because you're a queer subject, or because you look poor, if they put you on that cover, you're immediately going to register as either scandalous, or disgusting, or somehow abject. So I think these crime tabloids are tapping into that. Now, the movement that I'm interested in, the kind of movement that ASCO is doing, um, feminist artists and other artists were also doing in the 1970s, uh, especially in the middle of the 1970s, which is when ASCO sort of started to emerge. And the movement consists of the following. And it, somehow it sounds very strange to our days, um, but it consists of the following. It wasn't just about resisting this narrative by saying, our bodies are not disgusting, our bodies are not shameful, our bodies are positive, our bodies are beautiful, and our bodies need to be considered in a dignified way. It was, it was about that, showing beautiful queer subjects in photographs, but it was also about perverting the disgust. And I think that's where the really powerful gesture comes about. There's one example in particular that I found very compelling, and it has to do um, with the use of the term femicide. Uh, so this is a little bit of an offside, but I think it, it speaks to this gender contouring. If you look at the way in which the term femicide was used in English language newspapers in the 20th century, femicide was used for pornographic film ads and for really bad um, misogynist jokes before the 1970s. So you do a quick search, femicide, and you get ads and jokes about it, and, and it's quite abhorrent. But then something happens in 1976, there's a United Nations um, meeting that takes place in Brussels that brings together all kind of women and all kind of uh, female feminist activists and queer activists to Brussels 
and they start talking about femicide, not as a joke, not as something that you use to, you know, market a pornographic film, but as a crime that's committed against women. And this is where things get interesting. The activists describe that crime as follows. It's a crime that is often deemed to be too vulgar, too abhorrent, too disgusting to be talked about. Mm. But what we want to say is that that disgust does not belong to the object of the crime. It belongs to those of us who think it's too disgusting to talk about it. So again, this is the gesture that I think Oscar and all these feminists and all these queer and racialized artists were doing in the 1970s. Not just resisting the disgust and the shame that comes towards them by affirming the beauty and affirming the dignity that they rightfully deserve, but also by wondering, how about not just affirming our beauty and our dignity, but using that shame and that disgust in a way that helps us undo those racist and sexist structures. Um, and as a sort of um, add-on to that, it's worth remembering, when we talk about shame and disgust, we're not talking about something foreign. Shame and disgust are fundamental features of how we structure legal systems and how we enforce those legal systems. The more shameful, the more disgusting a crime is, the more severe it is, and hence, the more severe the punishment for that crime. So we use shame and disgust all the time. It's, it's not foreign to how we're constituted in a society. Why not use it in a way that allows us to more quickly, to more effectively undo those things that are, frankly, killing us all? Okay, so um, the tabloids show the crime and pain and hurt of underrepresented and marginalized peoples. Um, how, how do they find strength in that? They are given names and they are, um, they are given their stories, um, but it's all about negative things, about crime and pain. How can underrepresented people still find strength in that? So I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer with, uh, with concrete examples, I think it, it's worth remembering about this, this example I, I try to summarize about the funeral home. Um, I think one source of strength is, is visibility. Um, there's very few of us who are privileged enough or empowered enough to not feel um, seen and somehow giddy about appearing in some kind of mass print publication or appearing in an Instagram post that is shared by a few dozen people. I think that kind of visibility and that kind of a, a appearance, it brings a kind of strength, a uh, very problematic kind of strength in the case of crime tabloid, but uh, a source of strength and affirmation that, again, I'm not assuming that it exists. I'm sort of citing the work of these social scientists who are out in the field and who, who in fact, um, witnessed how this very problematic kind of visibility ended up providing a kind of affirmation for the subjects who appear um, uh, violently portrayed and, and abusively presented in these crime publications. I also have um, one anecdote from my own work with these crime tabloids. Um, it's a story about a female criminal. Uh, I think she was in her 30s when she was portrayed in a crime tabloid that was published in Medellin. And here I'm assuming um, that the substance of the testimony that the crime tabloid printed is more or less true. Crime tabloids, they usually printed um, the substance more or less in, 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 uh, factually, but they added like a few words to make it seem more bombastic. But the, the sort of subject of her testimony was the following. She told the reporters that were photographing her this directly. Yes, photograph me. Like, let them see me. Even if they see me as a criminal, at least they'll see me. This was the same kind of reaction that queer subjects um, whose appearance in these crime tabloids was recently sort of uh, anthologized, put together in a beautiful book called Mujercitos, published by Susana Vargas Cervantes. This is the same reaction that queer subjects, transvestites, transsexual, and homosexual subjects showed in the face of this camera, the crime tabloid camera, when the crime tabloid camera was there to cover their stories and make fun of them. You would think that if someone shows up to cover your story, and make fun of you, you would be, you'd be pretty upset, right? But these subjects were negotiating their own relationship to that camera. They were not only glad that the camera was there, they were posing. And the kind of coverage of these queer subjects, again, it's very abusive. It has all kinds of homophobic jokes. But the subject themselves, in a very conscious way, were 
negotiating that relationship with the camera, imposing in ways that I cannot begin to describe to you because they're absolutely fabulous. Clearly there was not a kind of one-way sort of direction of power there. These are subjects that were in a very kind of um, a subversive way, using that moment of capture by the photographic camera to try to seduce whoever was behind that camera or whoever was in front of that picture. And the seduction, quite frankly, worked because there's so many stories of queer subjects in that tabloid alarma that clearly the readers were you know, asking for more. So uh, that's, that's a kind of empowering, and again, I, this is all funny and it's all funny jokes, but it, it's, a complicated, um, it's a complicated matter how it, it provides uh, affirmation in the face of so much exploitation. I see a lot of hands, and I know that we're going to continue the conversation, but I'm afraid we have to stop here because uh, we have to uh, leave the uh, auditorium by seven. But we can continue the conversation um, right outside. Thank you, Sergio, so much for this. Thank you.